This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Dr. Charlotte de Cruz Jacobs, who is the Doctors Ben and A. Jesse Shenson Professor Emeritus of Medicine in the Department of Oncology at the Stanford University School of Medicine. She is the author of a new book, Henry Kaplan and the Story of Hodgkin's disease. Dr. Jacobs, welcome to Berkeley. Thank you very much. Where were you born and raised? I was uh, raised in Kingsport, Tennessee, in the eastern part of the state. And looking back, how do you think uh, your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, my mother was a homemaker. My father spent most of his uh, life as a chemical salesman. We were not of very much means. I was the second of five children. But in many ways, I had a very idyllic life. My parents were warm and caring and loved people. And I think that uh, is one thing that came to me. Now, the second is, although uh, we weren't of great means, we had a library card. Mm -hmm. And that was very important. And on Friday nights, my father, or sometimes both my parents, took us to the library. And I remember spending hours in the stacks looking at all these wonderful books, uh, even though I couldn't uh, read when we first started going there. Then we would come home, and my father would read to us. So uh, he read. Robert Louis Stevenson, and he loved to read poetry, uh, Longfellow and Frost. So I grew up with a great appreciation for books and literature. I think the other thing uh, that uh, really affected me at a very young age and made me interested in medicine, um, as funny as it sounds, was Horse Crickers. Horse Crickers was a club, a kid's club, mm. that was organized by Tennessee Eastman, where my father worked. And I think it was a way to get rid of your kids on Saturday morning so that you could do errands. And about 100 kids, 200 kids came, uh, a lot of noise going on. But at the end, in the last hour or two, they showed a movie. And there were two movies that struck me uh, deeply. One was a cowboy serial. And it was a cowboy. I'd call him a minor cowboy. His name was Lash LaRue. Not many people. Oh, I remember. Do you remember that. Lash <laughs> LaRue? Of so Lash LaRue went around doing all these wonderful things mm -hmm. for people in need. And that touched me. The second was a movie, I don't even remember the name of it. It may have been a serial uh, about Louis Pasteur and Edward mm -hmm. Jenner. And I sat fascinated. I remember I was only about five years old at these incredible medical discoveries. And people were throwing popcorn all around and whatnot. But hmm. I went home determined that I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to do science, and I wanted to help people. And, and so where did you take uh, this uh, ambition as far as college and medical school were concerned? Well, I first uh, didn't tell anyone for a long time except the postman who I used to make rounds with, and he just patted me on the head. Uh, because <laughs> <laughs> girls back then they didn't did have I. careers yeah. unless they wanted to be school teachers or nurses. But uh, So I didn't say much to anyone. Um, but finally, uh, one of my teachers in grade school uh, told me that she thought I could really be something in life. And that gave me a lot of confidence. And then in high school, I had a fabulous high school biology teacher mm -hmm. Uh, who took me to science fairs. This was in Cincinnati. We had moved there for a few years. And uh, really stimulated my interest in science and being a scientist. So I had both of those uh, under my belt. I applied to go to college at University of Rochester. And the reason I, that was my only school I applied to, uh, because they had my two loves. One, they were very strong in pre-med. 
and the sciences, and two, they had a, a big program of musical theater, and I loved musical theater. That was the other side of my life. So I uh, enjoyed uh, undergraduate school immensely. And then came time to apply for medical school again. At that time, most medical schools only took in a couple of women at that. And except one of my friends told me about a school I'd never heard of, uh, which is now one of the top schools, Washington University in St. Louis. And I went out to visit, and I was impressed that a fair number of their classmates were women. And it was so much more casual than, mm. than the East Coast. And people just seemed to have a, a joy of learning and doing medicine as opposed to uh, some of the rigidity that I'd seen on the East Coast. So I went to Washington University and was very happy there. And, and what uh, led you into the specialty of oncology? Was that just uh, the luck of the draw or teachers you had? or? Well, it wasn't teachers I had because uh, there wasn't much medical oncology at Washington University at that time. Uh, there were very strong hematologists, uh, some of the leaders in the country, and extremely strong internal medicine. So I loved internal medicine. In fact, I loved everything in medical school. I used mm -hmm. to say the last rotation I had was probably what I was going to end up being. But I was always struck uh, by cancer patients, um, by the needs they had, and by how early the field was. There was there was very little known except to do surgery or uh, radiation, but th there wasn't a, a whole lot. And it was a field that seemed to have so much promise, and I was drawn to medical oncology. I, I like to ask my guests what they see as the, the, the qualities of the mind and of character. Uh, and the skill base involved in what they do, and, and here as an oncologist, is 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 there is there something you can tell us about what makes for uh, somebody who can do that work well? I think you do have to care about patients uh, greatly because in medical oncology you're exposed to the highest of highs and the lowest of lows. It's just an amazing uh, uh, range of emotions that you're dealing with with your patients. But the interesting thing and the, and the one central characteristic I've noticed in all the oncologists I've known over the years is the majority of them are incredibly positive, hopeful, outgoing people, not people who are depressed or pulled down by cancer, but rather lifted up because of it. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you've written a book, which we're going to talk about in a minute, and uh, it's a masterful uh, story of, of one cancer and the doctor who found, uh, who was a key to finding the cure. So, but you're a biographer now, not just an oncologist. So let's talk briefly about that. Was you, you've already suggested that you liked literature and, and cultural things, I, and books and so on. So, so was it? Uh, what's the skill base in being a biographer? Well, I'll kind of go back to how I got interested, which I suspect may uh, ring uh, uh, a bell with you. It, um, when I was in grade school and uh, we went to the library, again, this was in Tennessee, they had a wonderful collection of children's biographies put out by Bob's Merrill Company. Mm. There were orange biographies, I don't know if you remember them, with little silhouettes. And I couldn't get enough of them. I, I had to read every single biography, and they were very popular uh, with all the kids. And so I've always loved biography uh, reading uh, throughout my life. I, I wasn't, I liked to write, but I wasn't particularly drawn to writing until far into my medical career. I was on sabbatical leave, and I decided I really wanted to learn to write. So I took some creative writing courses on the main campus, and here I was with a lot of hotshot Stanford undergrads who were <laughs> terrific writers. Uh, but I found I could write, and I could learn the craft of writing. Uh, soon thereafter, Henry Kaplan died. And I have no idea why, but I woke up one morning and said, I'm going to write his biography. And, and I never wavered from that. Uh, so I went back to my creative writing teacher and asked her who taught biography writing, because it was one thing to, to want to, to write a biography, but it was another to have the skills to do it. She said there weren't too many in the country who taught that, but there was someone on the Stanford campus named Ehud Havazelet, 
who's now at University of Oregon. And so I began taking a seminar with him. So for 15 years, even after he left Stanford, we mm. did it over the telephone, I continued to learn the craft of writing and biography writing uh, through Havazelet. Um, and but I just became so engaged in it. It's, it's a wonderful detective work that one has to do as a biographer. Uh, and as you go along, you're trying, the, the, the real onus of the biographer is to paint the right picture of the person. Um, I, and you, so you're gathering all kinds of facts. And when you're done, you have this enormous amount of information that you somehow have to weave into a narrative. And then it's as if somebody kind of plopped several tons of clay in the middle of the room and said, OK, now sculpt this person. And as you go along, you're constantly changing the shape of the nose or the cheekbones mm. until you really feel like you have the proper person. So the investigative work, all of the research, and then putting that all together, I found an enormous challenge. And, and I have to say, from the time I decided to write the biography until it was finally in print, there was hardly a day that I didn't wake up thinking, how can I carve out a few hours today to work on this mm. book? Uh, that's how much I enjoyed the process. Let, let me show the book, and then I want to ask you a question before we talk about Dr. Kaplan and Hodgkin's disease. And what, what I'm curious about is sort of the emotions uh, and the mastery of your emotions as a physician and as a writer. And is there, is there any overlap? Or are they entirely different? I, I'm struck here by your account of the patients who participated in the protocol and the, the way you're able to zero in on their stories and tell, it, tell the stories without being overwhelmed by emotional involvement. And this must be true also as a doctor. Well, it was easier as a writer than it is as a doctor. <laughs> um, I think that as a writer, one has to have a, a little bit of detachment, particularly about your subject. Uh, if you get too close to the subject, you can't be objective. So um, that was easier with uh, Kaplan. I think being an oncologist or being a physician allowed me to understand uh, his work more and certainly allowed me to understand the patients and what they were going through so that as they told me their stories I uh, or their families if they were deceased told me their stories I, I could I could really understand it but it, it I wanted to evoke the emotion, but not uh, pour the emotion right, uh, right. All, all over it. And you did what you just said, sculpted these stories so some, uh, the reader can actually look at these stories or read the story. Well, I thought of the book as really three strands. Uh, one was the biography of Kaplan. That's the main strand. The, the second is the history of Hodgkin's disease. And the third are the patient stories. And I actually had a long timeline or outline that I pasted all the way across my wall that showed all the strands and when they uh, intersected. Because I felt that to understand Kaplan as a doctor, you had to understand his relationship with patients. and that I needed to have patient stories to make Hodgkin's disease human. Uh, and, and not just a disease, but a disease that really affected people so that they could illustrate the successes and the, and the disappointments and tragedies. I would like to move between these, these various stories. And I guess the, I thought I would start by uh, having you talk a little uh, about what Hodgkin's disease is and and uh, uh, and the and it is a success story. So so t t tell us a little about Hodgkin's disease, which is a lymphatic cancer. Okay, so uh, that's exactly what it is. It's a it, there are a group of cancers called lymphomas, but Hodgkin's disease has a is a little separate from them, although it is a cancer of lymph tissue. Um, it usually affects uh, two groups, either young people, that's what makes it so poignant, uh, often in their teens and early 20s, and then there's a second peak in adults uh, around 50 years of age uh, who develop the disease. It usually starts in the neck, in the lymph node enlargement in the neck, or lymph nodes in the chest that are picked up incidentally on a chest x-ray. It spreads 
like no other cancer in a sense. It spreads in a very predictable pattern from one lymph node to the next contiguous lymph node group until it has spread to lymph node groups throughout the body and then gets in the bloodstream and affects the main organs, the liver, the lungs, etc. Um, back, well, one other point I should make is it's a disease that is grouped into people who have symptoms or don't, symptoms being fever, and it has a very particular pattern where there's a fever for many days and then no fever and then a fever for many days. It's called the picket fence fever because it's like a picket fence. Um, significant weight loss or drenching night sweats, so patients have to get up and change their bed clothing. So patients are staged um, in stage one, meaning one lymph node group, stage two, two groups on either side of the diaphragm, three lymph nodes throughout the body, four, an organ involvement, and then a letter A or B, whether they have the absence or uh, the presence of uh, systemic symptoms. So the disease was discovered by Sir Thomas Hodgkin, who was a British pathologist uh, back in 1828. So, so the, the, the really interesting thing in the book is the story goes back a long way. It, it's a painstaking uh, uh, series of efforts by physicians and non-physicians, and, and it's really about, well, what is this? I mean, so, so the identity of the ailment is very important. That's absolutely true. So when he, he was a pathologist and, uh, at Guy's Hospital, and uh, he was very important in the history of medicine because he was one of the few that wanted to do autopsies and then link it with clinical histories so that he desc could describe a, a full disease. And when a uh, child, Ellenberg King, was brought to him, uh, deceased, to do an autopsy, he found these very enlarged lymph nodes that had almost, he called them cartilaginous in their feeling. And uh, he had never seen it before. Um, and then someone brought him another uh, person a while later, and, and it rung a bell. And so suddenly he began to collect a series of these, which he called an affliction of the lymph gland. He didn't, certainly didn't name it after himself. And he described it beautifully, wrote a paper. Um, but uh, he then left Guy's Hospital uh, because he was uh, a little bit of a rabble rouser and, uh, and uh, left the field of, of medicine and actually became a, uh, an activist uh, with Moses Montefiore, he traveled all over the world predominantly trying to uh, rescue Jews and died himself in, of cholera and was buried in, um, near Tel Aviv. And I, and his work was buried in the, in the bowels of uh, some library at the same time. So it was never thought of for many, many years until another British pathologist also uh, started describing this disease. Now, for a long time, people didn't know what it was. Some people thought it was tuberculosis. Some people thought it was a malignancy. And uh, so the kind of next major step was a, a woman pathologist at Johns Hopkins in uh, 1902 who uh, actually found the cell in these lymph nodes, the malignant cell called uh, the Reed Sternberg cell, although she wasn't even sure it was uh, malignant. And she was the first and, to- And her name was, so the cell is named after her partially. Well, it's, it's interesting. So she described the cell at the same time a pathologist in Germany named Carl Sternberg uh, described the cell. And there was a lot of friction between the two of them because he was very dogmatic that it was a form of tuberculosis and she was very dogmatic that it was not a form of tuberculosis. And uh, it was interesting that their names were united in history when they uh, really were kind of arch enemies. <laughs> and and, and uh, there, I was fascinated by the fact that in the, the history of Hodgkin's disease there, there are two women who are really important. Uh, Reed is one, and the other Vera is Peters. Vera Peters. And in, in the case of Reed, after she had done this very important work, she was unable to get a, she was a physician and was unable to get a position at Johns Hopkins where she was doing the work. So, so it, it, again, it's a remarkable story, and, and I, I was intrigued by the fact that two women did path-breaking work, and, and uh, Vera Peterson really Peters. helped. Peters, sorry, That's Peters helped us help uh, 
to help build the story of the disease by understanding the staging process. Yes, right? so Vera Peters was a Canadian radiation oncologist at the uh, Princess Margaret Hospital. Uh, and quite a remarkable woman. I did get to interview her uh, before she uh, died. She uh, became very interested in treating Hodgkin's disease as she was learning it from her mentor, Gordon uh, Richards. And what they had learned from, uh, actually, everyone always steps on someone else's stepping stone, mm -hmm. uh, from Rene Gilbert uh, in Switzerland, was that the disease seemed to, as I said, spread to contiguous nodes. So he said, why not, besides radiating the node that's involved, why not radiate the next group of lymph nodes to kind of prevent it from spreading? Uh, the only thing before radiation that had been used was surgery, and they'd cut out lymph nodes, and the disease would come right back. So radiation was really the only uh, known treatment at the time. So that she and her mentor uh, started treating patients not only with uh, local uh, nodes, but contiguous nodes. And uh, she also came up with this staging system that I mentioned, or some, uh, some variant thereof. Well, her mentor went on to die uh, of bone marrow failure because of all the radiation exposure that he had had. And she was kind of left alone, this demure, uh, uh, very uh, humble uh, woman uh, who grew up on a farm to kind of charge forward to tell the world that she and he thought that you could cure people with early stage Hodgkin's disease with radiation. Now this was at a time when everybody thought that Hodgkin's disease was fatal. It was just a matter of time, you would die from it, and patients were treated palliatively. And uh, she uh, stood up at an international conference and said that she felt sure that they had cured a certain percentage of patients with early stage Hodgkin's disease, and cure being that five years <clears throat> after their treatment they had not uh, recurred, and their survival curve was parallel to the survival curve of other people uh, who were not ill with uh, cancer. Well, no one believed her. Uh, people were very skeptical. They said terrible things about her. Um, but Henry Kaplan was in that audience. That was in 1956. And although he was a radiation oncologist then and doing a lot of cancer work, um, he went home and looked back at some of the patients treated years before at Stanford and found, in fact, that some of them had still survived. And he believed her. And he began then treating patients with aggressively, but he took everything she did five steps forward, and he was determined that he was going to cure every patient with Hodgkin's disease, not just patients with early stage. Let's talk now about uh, uh, Kaplan, uh, your, your book. Uh, it, it tells his story with a great deal of complexity, so we, we have a sense of all the dimensions of his life and, and how they all came together. And so let's talk a little about his background because he uh, uh, he had grown up in a family where there was death in the family from Kotchkin, uh, from I'm sorry, not from cancer, from lung cancer, and that really motivated him to to want to go out there and conquer the disease, cancer in general. Well, I have to scroll back a little before yeah. that because when I when I was writing uh, the book, I actually pinpointed what I thought were the major turning points in mm -hmm. his life, um, and the first uh, was his birth, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, as it is for all of us, but more so for him. So his mother um, came from Russia um, and was part of the Russian intelligentsia, even though they were uh, Jewish and born under Tsar, she was born during Tsar Nicholas II. And her father was a, a very successful businessman. She had ground into her by her father that unless you were perfect, perfect in physique and intellect and behavior, you would get everything taken away from you and relegated to one of the shtetls, where most of the Jews lived at that time. Um, so uh, perfection was, was a key word in that family. Well, finally, when the pogroms got uh, so bad, they finally immigrated uh, in the early 1900s and ended up in Chicago. And uh, she worked very hard. They were starting all over again, and finally married a dentist and wanted to rise to the type of life that they had had in Russia. So when her first child was born, she assumed he'd be perfect. 
Um, and he was in his behavior, and he was a darling little boy, except he was born with two giant fingers on his right hand um, and some enlarged toes on his left foot. <clears throat> well, she became obsessed obsessed because if they were back in Russia, he would never have gotten to go to school, he'd be ridiculed, um, and uh, his life would be meaningless. Uh, so she saw many, many specialists. Uh, she <clears throat> had uh, tried to get someone to amputate his fingers. Uh, she found an orthopedist that finally put a huge brace on them trying to uh, stunt their growth, but they grew bigger. And finally, when she went to a pediatrician, he said, take that terrible brace off this child and just make him strong. So that became her mantra. She was going to make her son strong. She told her son that God had made a mistake with his fingers but gave him a bigger brain to make up with it for it. And so everything became an educational exercise. And so his his drive and his intellect came from his mother who pushed 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 and he loved it. I mean he did he never mm -hmm. rebelled against her. In the meantime his father was a dentist. <clears throat> And he made him laugh. He used to tickle him, take him fishing, read to him. He was a, a wonderful, warm father. <clears throat> when uh, Kaplan was 16, his father, at the age of 45, developed lung cancer. He was a very heavy smoker. And Henry, his mother, had to go back to work now. So Henry stayed home and took care of his father and uh, was very, very close to him. His father died, and at his father's funeral, Henry Kaplan stood up and pledged that he would cure cancer. Mm -hmm. and, and that was the turning point that set him on this, uh, this passionate drive to cure cancer. And uh, as a result of the economic conditions uh, uh, that arose from his father's death, his mother had to open a pharmacy, he, he actually was a helper in that pharmacy, which sort of built in him a, a a commitment to work and a willingness to work, a hard worker he was, and, and that also carried over yes, into his uh, work. I called it a Spartan existence because yeah. they were left <clears throat> penniless uh, afterwards, and the mother had studied pharmacy and did open a pharmacy. He worked there many hours. He went to the University of Chicago High School and then on to University of Chicago and walked miles uh, rather than spend money, and they had no money for a streetcar. And uh, you're right, he had an incredible work ethic um, and had an ability to be doing multiple things at one time. He'd, he'd be, he, he worked in the pharmacy and he actually did all the pills um, and uh, then worked in the postal uh, station and people would be uh, lined up, his younger brother said, uh, to mail things because he'd have his nose in the book and then suddenly realize they were there and do all the postal work. So. And, and as a as a physician, that this background, uh, this uh, storytelling, that you know, listening to his father and so on, he he was uh, he he had a mixture. It seems as you describe him of somebody who was hard driving, and in some ways could be ruthless with colleagues because he wanted to to shape his work with excellence and, and move the field forward. But at the same time, he was a, a very uh, uh, comfortable with patients, uh, with their stories, and was somebody who could hold a patient's hand and, and really see them as a person and not just an object of, of treatment. Yeah, you're absolutely right. He got his, uh, his perfectionism and his drive from his mother. But he used to go to his father's office and he would watch his father joke with patients. His father had a wonderful personality, uh, not charge patients who were having financial troubles. So uh, I think Kaplan did get some of the b best from both of them. He, he was a consummate clinician. He, he, was, he was absolutely wonderful with patients. Uh, many patients that I interviewed would kind of resound the same thing, that when he was in a room with them, they were the only person in the world. There could be pages going on. There could be chaos outside that door. But he was totally focused on them. He knew all their their children if they were married, they knew about their trips, he knew about their education. In his files were every single postcard, birthday card, wedding announcement that he had from any single patient. He even would take people into his home 
if they came from far away to be treated and had nowhere to stay. He treated many, many patients for nothing. And so he was, he was a, a very dedicated physician. Uh, his career seems to have uh, combined so many uh, different set of tasks. So when, when you look at him, he, he was obviously a leader in the field, and we'll talk about in a minute, but, but he was also a scientist. Uh, and uh, so while he was both a practicing physician, he was also somebody who was very concerned about uh, developing uh, the science of, of radiology uh, uh, and all the different fields that that uh, contribute to uh, to it, uh, but he was also an institution building. So I guess we have to have you talk a little about the fact that he was uh, fortunate to come to Stanford uh, before the time its greatness of, as a medical school had been established. So ironically, uh, the Stanford Medical School was in San Francisco, but it had to move to the farm <laughs> to become truly a, a major center. T talk about that and his role, because it was ap absolutely pivotal. So it's not just that he built up radiation, it was that he was key in building the school up. Yes. So um, Stanford, which initially was called, it was part of the University of the Pacific and then Cooper Medical College, it was established in 1859, uh, initially uh, was quite a wonderful school because the people that uh, started the school, uh, Elias Cooper, uh, really were investigative in their attitude. Um, and so it was going on a trajectory, it was the first medical school on the West Coast, when the war came and uh, all funds and effort were now directed toward just producing practicing physicians. And so when he came to Stanford in 1948, it had been past its heyday, and this wonderful hospital was just full of chipped paint and hanging wires, and uh, it was really considered a pretty mediocre, not very distinguished medical school that put out good practitioners. That was the reputation. Now, Henry Kaplan was one of the rising stars in radiology, um, and he had had a position at Yale. And uh, so it surprised a lot of people why in the world he would come to Stanford. But at Stanford, he saw several things. One, he knew what he wanted in, in building a radiology department. And at that point, radiology and radiation oncology were combined. He wanted not only to give excellent patient care, but he wanted to have them do research, um, and uh, he wanted to have outstanding teaching. And he didn't see a single program, even the top programs in the country, that, that met what his expectations were. And so in a sense, at Stanford, he had a, a clean slate. Um, so he was really a visionary. He I was a visionary. A visionary. Yeah. But uh, he also looked down the peninsula to Stanford University, which had enormous resources and space. And he, he saw what now what was called Stanford Medical School was and really dreamed about what it could be. So he didn't want to just shape his own department. He wanted to help shape the school as well. And now, often, he, he had a reputation as a dean killer. Um, he said he never wanted to be the dean. He only wanted to make the decisions for the deans. <laughs> <laughs> and <laughs> so he was, um, he, he was uh, absolutely dogmatic in how he thought the school should be shaped and uh, wanted to help control that and was one of the first academic, truly academic, research-oriented uh, faculty members at Stanford. So that when President Sterling said he wanted to consider moving the medical school down to the campus, uh, Kaplan was just right behind it and pushed, and a couple of deans just left because they couldn't deal with his pushing and pushing uh, for them to move down. And he wanted to help bring the faculty. He wanted Nobel laureates. He said he wanted intellectual playmates. He even picked the architect 
to design what is a, a spectacularly beautiful medical center. So he, he wanted to, to do all of it, which amazed me because, as you say, he was doing basic science research. He was developing a linear accelerator. He was treating patients. He was starting a training program, building a department, and, in a sense, building the school at the same time. And, and he really, in this, this institution building of Stanford, he really had uh, a powerful sense of that this was interdisciplinary work, that you had to build up all the related fields uh, in order for uh, his work uh, and the work of, of cancer research to, to th mm -hmm. try. Talk about that, because th th that really has proved to be very important, and we're seeing that even at Berkeley, where there's no medical school, how much interdisciplinary work and the way fields feed into mm -hmm. each other. So uh, he wanted and helped uh, bring, as I said, a lot of basic scientists, uh, and biochemists and uh, geneticists and whatnot, because he felt the whole field of cancer couldn't move forward without having a strong uh, basic science underpinning. Um, so, and in a sense, and he did his own laboratory research. So, in a sense, he was one of the original translationalists, uh, bed to bedside, bedside to laboratory. Um, uh, laboratory to bedside uh, physicians. He also knew, however, that you couldn't go under after a cancer very well uh, single-handedly. That in order to really approach a cancer, and Hodgkin's disease just happened to be the model, that you needed a team with a medical oncologist, pathologist, radiologist, surgeons, radiation oncologists, all coming together to put all their talents toward curing one cancer. And so he He's predominantly responsible for the cure of Hodgkin's disease, but not alone, through all these people that he gathered. And his uh, predominant colleague, of course, was uh, Saul Rosenberg. And that model then, that multidisciplinary approach to model, spread throughout Stanford to different cancers and actually is the model used at most cancer centers today to treat cancer, where a multidisciplinary team approaches a cancer. Mm -hmm. And and with his colleague, uh, 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 with his colleagues, Kaplan was the kind of person who had big elbows, and and he could uh, the the very people he would bring, he would then wind up being in conflict with, and and I gather that it was that that conflict was central to creating the tension that, that really leads to breakthrough. Yes, I, I think so. He, uh, he, he felt that you could never make uh, progress uh, in the absence of argument, in the absence of debate. Uh, Sounds <laughs> like a Jewish <laughs> characteristic, if I may say. But uh, he lacked uh, a couple of things. I say that positively. <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah. okay. He had, um, he, he had a lack of patience, not with his patients, yeah. but with anyone else, he that he, he he had no tolerance for ignorance. So he wanted to charge ahead. Uh, so he lacked that patience. And the other is that he was he lacked any good political sense. He wasn't the kind of person who would schmooze with people. He almost had on blinders, and he. He had this passion to cure cancer. He had this passion to build Stanford into the greatest medical school in the country. And he just charged ahead. And he didn't, he, he wasn't willfully necessarily being uh, mean to certain people, although he was to some. Um, he, he knew where he wanted to go. Uh, he thought he knew the best path to get there, and uh, he, he just didn't want to talk about other things. He wanted to, to get there, to, to really charge ahead. And that left, uh, and sometimes when he would become impatient, uh, his tongue could be very sharp, and that led to a lot of uh, arguments between himself and Saul Rosenberg that almost became uh, famed in the oncology world. Um, it also led to a lot of arguments and breach of friendships between him and some of the basic scientists that he brought here to be his intellectual playmates. Uh, so when he got wound up and got going, uh, he, he was a force to reckon with. Now, the, these, uh, all of these characteristics that we're talking about sort of come together in, uh, uh, in one of his major achievements was to uh, make 
uh, the linear accelerator at Stanford a, a, a tool for use in cancer treatment. And it, it's as if being at Stanford, all the activity that then was going on, the linear accelerator was there. He hears about it, and then what does he do about it, and how does it become such an important tool? Okay. So let me, I'm just going to scroll back a little yeah, bit. Yeah. Um, maybe I should say just briefly how radiation works, because I yeah. think that would help. Um, so what happens is that electrons are in a vacuum tube are uh, given an electrical charge and sped up, and then they're crashed into a medical target where they collide with atoms, and energy goes off in the form of x-rays. And then when x-rays penetrate a living cell, they cause biological changes and death. And the ability to penetrate more deeply beyond the skin, say in a human being, um, and more sharply is related to the energy of those x-rays. So that the higher you can, the more voltage that you can crank up to accelerate these electrons, the more the energy and the better the radiation. Now, when he started at Stanford, he had a machine, an old machine, that had uh, that accelerated electrons. It was a 250,000 volt machine. That, that's what he had. And then as time went on, cobalt or gamma rays came around, and they could uh, get X-ray going at about six million volt, uh, one million volt. Uh, but there was a lot of scatter. They weren't nice, clean beams. And he used to say that cobalt was a shotgun, and he wanted a rifle. And uh, so that linear accelerators were being used uh, in physics research after the war, but not for patient care. They hadn't been modified or adapted uh, for patient care. And at a cocktail party, he heard a conversation, overheard a conversation about a linear accelerator that was being developed on the main campus uh, where uh, they were accelerating electrons up to six million volts. And uh, so he met with Ed Ginston, and uh, together they planned a linear accelerator for human use. And so that really was one of the very first linear, medical linear accelerators. Um, and uh, he now did have his, his uh, rifle. He uh, could uh, treat deeper cancers with much more success and use higher doses with much less scatter and damage uh, to other organs. Uh, so. And, and his, his second major accomplishment with regard to that was to identify the field. That is, yes. where exactly do you have to fire this gun? So he often said that uh, when, when asked close to his death uh, what he uh, wanted to be remembered for, he said not only the development of one of the first linear accelerators, uh, but the standards for its use. Uh, because the linear accelerator, the same linear accelerators used today with some modifications, it's the major treatment uh, source for radiation. And uh, so he uh, helped really define how to use it. That applies to cancer, all cancers that are having undergoing radiation. But with regard to Hodgkin's disease, because as I told you at the beginning, it's kind of a disease that spreads from nodal group to nodal group to nodal group. Um, radiation therapists at that time would treat these lymph nodes, and then they'd treat these lymph nodes, and then they'd treat these lymph nodes. And so it could take six to 12 months to treat all the lymph node groups, and you're just kind of chasing your tail, and they use low dose. He not only used high dose, but he designed two radiation fields. Uh, one was called the mantle because it looked like a, 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 a mantle where he included the neck and the uh, lymph nodes under the arm and the axilla, and in the center of the chest called the mediastinum, all in one lymph node, well, all in one field, treatment field, and then something called the inverted Y that took care of all the uh, lymph nodes in the, along the back of the abdomen, called periortic, and into the groin. And so in two different fields, he could treat all of the lymph nodes, and he did that at, at uh, high dose. It was very controversial at the time. And in, in fact, he was a leader uh, because in, in convening international conferences to agree to the protocols that would define what it took to cure uh, the 
Hodgkin's disease. And, and so that was a, another aspect uh, of, of what was being accomplished, because the story that you're telling is really about, well, what is it, how do you chase it, and then how do you kill it, and what are the rules by which we would do that? So you bring up two things. One, so after he'd heard Vera Peters, and now he had his linear accelerator, he went back, designed these ports, and started treating people with high dose to uh, con these different ports, to contiguous nodes. And he had a medical oncologist who had just joined him, Saul Rosenberg, and the two of them uh, would talk about patient treatment together. And they always fought over tra patient treatment because he was using doses five times what other people were using and to, and to large fields. And uh, he knew that that was better, but Rosenberg kept saying, you're never going to convince the rest of the world, you're never going to convince the community unless you do a randomized trial where half the patients get the new treatment and half the patients get the standard treatment and you follow them long enough to show that there's a difference. Now that is what we do all the time now, it's called randomized clinical trials, but none were done at that period in time and so Kaplan and Rosenberg started the first randomized clinical trials which are applied to all cancers. Uh, so that was another one of their claim to fame. Then the, the next thing that you're alluding to is Kaplan didn't want to just cure people who came to see him. He wanted to cure Hodgkin's disease throughout the world. And so he gathered the top specialists from around the world so that they would all come to agreement on the staging of Hodgkin's disease, the treatment of Hodgkin's disease. Now those were contentious because not everyone was in agreement. Uh, so, but he, he really wanted to, to influence treatment everywhere. Now we should, there's a side story here, and, and again, uh, we, there's a limit to what we can cover in an hour, but uh, uh, simultaneous to what we've just described, uh, a route of chemotherapy was being developed. Uh, the, the key figure who also built on the work that had preceded him was Dr. DeVita, who developed the, the uh, uh, four, the, who combined four chemicals together called MOP for the uh, treating of Hodgkin's disease uh, with these chemicals. One, and I, I guess what I would like to, we can't, we don't have time to tell the whole story there, but the important thing is that there is serendipity in a lot of this. And the, the story that I find fascinating, uh, uh, as I should say, as a former uh, Hodgkin's patient, uh, is that it was a explosion during World War II, uh, a mustard gas plant blew up and that was what led to the realization that mustard gas was one of four chemicals that could help in shrinking the lymphatic tumors. So it, it wasn't a plant. Actually, it was uh, a ship. It, uh, ship, ship yes. Ship. In, in World War II, there were a group of uh, Allied cargo ships off the uh, coast, eastern coast of uh, Italy, and uh, it was a quiet December evening, and suddenly the Luftwaffe attacked and blew up 16 cargo ships, and uh, 600 men were rescued uh, from the water and uh, taken to hospitals. And uh, they all had, many of them had a reddish blush uh, on their skin. Uh, the nurses and physicians thought maybe it was from burns. Uh, but as time went on, time being hours, uh, they developed these huge, large blisters that they described as the size of goose eggs. And then their skin began to actually rub off. Other people who had come in had a gritty sensation in their eyes and uh, compresses were put on their eyes. And when the nurses tried to remove them, uh, the patients couldn't see. Uh, their corneas were totally clouded and in some cases there were big ulcers uh, in their eyes. And then a third group of patients, uh, well some of the same ones, were coughing. They thought maybe they had a little uh, pneumonia from being in the water for a while. Uh, but they were choking to death on mucus that was so thick. Uh, one historian said they couldn't even get it, they could barely get a knitting needle uh, through it. Um, and uh, so about 14 hours uh, after they had been rescued, uh, news came uh, to them that one of the ships um, uh, had been carrying surreptitiously because uh, uh, 
poisonous gases were really, uh, many countries had signed that they would not use poisonous gases at that point. Um, that one of the ships was carrying um, 100 tons of mustard bombs to be held in case Germany started to use poisonous gases. And so when that ship blew up, then all those 600 men were just bathed in liquid mustard. Um, now, 85 of them uh, died, and the remainder had uh, serious injuries. All of that was kept from the public, of course, uh, the sensitivity of that. It was probably kept from the, from the sailors themselves. But there were two uh, pharmacists, uh, scientists uh, in Maryland who were trying to find an antidote to mustard in case there was an attack. And so they got the reports of these autopsies. And they were really, they saw the usual things, all the burns and whatnot, because that's what it did, and the asphyxiation. Those were the known effects. But what puzzled them is that the bone marrow had been totally obliterated, as had the lymph nodes, and they had never seen that before. So they began to make mustard solutions and study it in mice and found that it killed rapidly dividing cells. And they thought, well, what's the most rapidly dividing cell? It's cancer. So under top secrecy, they treated six people with solutions of mustard in their vein. And two of them had a wonderful response, two patients with advanced lymphoma. And that was the birth of chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. And mustard, the mustard gas went on to become nitrogen mustard, which was the major first drug used for treatment of Hodgkin's disease. And, and then later, DeVita then combined it with other chemicals that had been uh, uh, developed independently, and, and a formula was developed by someone to actually figure out the... the so the, what the, happened, it, it's interesting because we think of big drug companies or the NIH uh, doing all drug development, uh, but, uh, well, I told you how nitrogen mustard came about. One of the other drugs came about because someone was studying periwinkle plant in Ontario uh, because it in, uh, in folklore, Indian folklore, it was supposed to be good for treating diabetes. Diabetes. And when he tried it in rats, they all died and had overwhelming infections and it obliterated the bone marrow. And again, that was the beginning of another chemotherapy drug. So they all have these kind of interesting stories. But when DeVita went to the National Cancer Institute to train, uh, there was someone there named uh, Emil Fry uh, who was beginning to put drugs together to treat leukemia and starting to get, for the first time, good results in children with leukemia. And uh, uh, Vince DeVita thought, well, if you could do it in leukemia, why not Hodgkin's disease? And he and uh, several other people uh, put together uh, this regimen based on a lot of chemotherapy principles that had come from the laboratory. But, uh, and so he reported the first absolutely outstanding responses uh, to what's called MOP chemotherapy. And again, no one believed him. I mean, <laughs> it was just too good to be true. So in the end, uh, the, the story of Hodgkin's disease is about a su successful cure through both uh, the use of chemotherapy combined with radiation. So uh, I, I think our audience has to go read the book because we can't tell all the stories. But, but what, what are the lessons that we might draw from these two stories about, you know, where, as we look to the future, we, we might, you know, find uh, the Hodgkins story pointing the way for different cures with different cancers, not one cure for all cancers, but are, are there lessons here about the kind of researchers, scientists, and doctors that will make it possible and, and the way medicine learns and grows? Well, I think uh, one is certainly uh, the passion with which these men went after cancer. I mean, and Vincent, women, and women. And women excuse me, uh, uh, <laughs> these people. <laughs> so whether you talk about Vera Peters or Henry Kaplan or Vince DeVita or Saul Rosenberg, they were all passionate about what they wanted to do. They were true cancer fighters. Um, and I think uh, people need to have that kind, of, that kind of drive because particularly today, it's so easy to get sidetracked into, into so many other um, issues and things. Um, I think the second is um, that for the physician going into cancer uh, research 
is you have to be willing to fight. That, that's one of the things I, I learned from Kaplan. Uh, you had to fight for what you believed in um, in order to, to make uh, progress. Uh, that everything can't be done by committee, even though multidisciplinary teams are important and, and really are a way to go. Uh, that, uh, that one has to, to stand on, uh, on what you believe. Um, but there are many lessons in terms of serendipity, the use of multidisciplinary groups, the use of clinical trials. All of those things applied to, to all of uh, cancer. And, and so, so I think Henry Kaplan influenced uh, a lot of the way that cancer uh, is treated and, and gone after today. What, one of the side stories that you tell uh, in two instances, uh, one is Nixon's war on cancer and then the fight at Stanford to, to have a cancer institute or not in, in an early period. And, and so the, the politics uh, and the science actually point in, in different ways. So the politics might say, okay, let's put down a lot of money, let's have a focus, let's win the war on cancer. But the science tells us that it's more complicated than that and that, that in fact you have to allow for serendipity, you have to have a lot of decentralized research. And in fact, uh, in Kaplan's time, his colleagues said, we don't want a cancer institute because it would make us too narrowly focused on cancer and might misshape the future of the medical school. Well, I think in bringing up that Cancer Act, I think uh, you bring up something I should have said in answering the other question, yeah. and that is that scientific freedom is so crucial, absolutely crucial in, uh, in making progress. And so that uh, when Nixon signed that Cancer Act, which really people thought was one of his finest accomplishments, it had really, there had been two years of kind of battling that, that went on beforehand uh, when a, a woman who uh, was a great philanthropist um, and director, uh, advisor to presidents uh, named Mary Lasker, who's another important woman in this book, uh, but she had decided it was time to have a moonshot for cancer and so that she had a panel of consultants uh, arranged for them uh, to be organized to uh, get a bill passed uh, that eventually uh, Nixon could sign. And the components of that bill included having a game plan. She thought it should be just like the moonshot or the Manhattan Project, that you have a, a game plan, that you hire the scientists, that you give them a road map, and voila, you'll have a cure for cancer. And Henry Kaplan used to say, well, that's like trying to put a man on the moon without knowing Newton's law of gravity. Uh, that It's more complex than that. And he was kind of a voice in the wilderness uh, speaking for uh, scientific freedom, for the allowing of serendipity, uh, uh, not to try to guide scientists, uh, because no one knows all the twists and turns. And uh, he ended up uh, with a, a pretty big battle uh, uh, against Mary Lasker and in Washington, which ultimately uh, led to his being blackballed from a national role, but he stood by his gun. So I think scientific freedom is very important. Um, with what came out of that Cancer Act was millions and millions of dollars to set up uh, cancer centers around the United States. There were only three at that time in the United States. And it was obvious a shoe in that Stanford would get one, and that was Henry Kaplan's dream, because then millions of dollars would come together, you'd have basic scientists working with the clinicians, and that he was just had this fabulous dream, but he hadn't laid the groundwork. He, he as I said, he wasn't political. He had made a lot of enemies along the way, and when what finally happened in the long run, although many of them will say it just wasn't right for Stanford, um, he, he got felled in the end uh, by his own personality. Uh, they simply did not want him to have that much control at Stanford. And that, that was one of his greatest uh, sadness in his whole career. Uh I want to tell our audience again that they, they have to read the book because it's a, it's a fascinating read uh, and it, it uh, combines so many stories, the, the stories of the patients who participated in the protocol, the, the story of Henry Kaplan and the other researchers, but also the, the story of uh, the disease itself. So I, I want to thank you for writing the book and for uh, coming to be on our program. It was thank a great you so honor. Much. Thank, thank you. you, and thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history.